Hello again everyone, me, Matsumas here with you today, thank you so much for being here. Today we are discussing leadership, and for me, leadership is an ongoing learning process. I guess I can say for myself, currently, I have three different lifestyles that I apply leadership to. Firstly, my civilian career that I have as my normal day-to-day -day job. I'm actually a leader, a supervisor slash manager of sorts, uh, dealing with many different styles of leadership that I have to use in my everyday work. Secondary to that, I'm also a leader in the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, completing my PLQ. Still got a couple of bits and pieces to tail off on uh, tying that up. But uh, I've completed leadership courses both in the British Army and Canadian Armed Forces, and I'm aspiring to eventually become a leader within my own um, reserve unit that I'm part of with the Canadian Artillery, and working quite heavily to do so. And finally, my, I guess, final uh, leadership function is that as of a father. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't quite realize that when you are a parent, you are automatically setting yourself up to become a leader. And even those who don't feel like they want to be leaders, they like to follow, in some regard, within your lifestyle, I can guarantee you there is applications of leadership you need to have. It's just something that we as humans like to do for the most part. And I'm not saying that everybody wants to be a leader and wants to, you know, create this team structure where you're being able to be in charge or or create you know direction or a vision of where that team's meant to go but leadership doesn't just apply to being in a team role it's leadership in your own lifestyle that can sometimes apply too and i always love to learn from experiences and information and educational uh, tidbits so to speak in regards to leadership and i i never say to myself yeah i'm a great leader i know what i'm doing perfectly there is always room to improve even the greatest leaders out there are never perfect when it comes to leadership there's always room for improvement and when i find opportunities to learn and to take away from other people's experiences that could benefit me i am definitely one to capitalize on that straight away recently i did find a really cool seminar from an air force um nco or senior nco i guess who is discussing the i guess principles of leadership accountability of leadership and how important it is to, you know, basically use your leadership skills effectively and use them to a benefit to everyone as a team and, and to be proactive in what you use leadership for. I thought this was a great seminar to listen to. It really spoke to me and I think, you know, it's really prevalent to those wishing to join the armed forces, but not just those join the armed forces. The points that I'm going to show you in this seminar, which I'm going to share in today's video, relate to everything. Like I said, being a father, a mother, brother, sister, whatever it may be, your civilian career, it can apply for almost anything. And the points that this uh, this gentleman made really did say, you know what, like you can apply that. You can apply that to your own lifestyle. It's going to benefit you and you can take a lot away from it. And maybe it might help, maybe it won't. Maybe some of the points that, you know, he's sharing won't relate to me. However, I'm still going to try. And I, like I said, I like to learn from other people's experiences, especially with an individual with such a huge military background as this person does. Um, so let's take a look at this video. I would uh, strongly suggest you grab yourself a beer or uh, a snack, some popcorn, sit down, take a bit of time to yourself, don't be distracted, listen into this seminar and see if it speaks to you and see if you can take away something that will hopefully benefit you in being a leader in whatever level of lifestyle you need it to be in. Let's take a look. Well, first, let me say how honored I am to be here today. Uh, thank you, uh, General Severia, Chief Boyer, and the rest of the USAFA and NCLS team for inviting me and my teammates out. And uh, thank you to all of you for, for attending. Uh, this, it, it, I, it looks to me like this is going to be a great conference, my first time experiencing NCLS, so I'm really looking forward to all the wonderful speakers that we have lined up today. Uh, this, this uh, Remember the Titans was a movie that was made in the year 2000. And uh, it's my all-time favorite movie. Uh, I'm a huge Denzel Washington fan, uh, but it's really my favorite movie. I was teaching PME at the time. It's my favorite movie because of this scene. This scene, this image, it has been burned into my memory. If, and if you haven't seen the movie, you should really check it out uh, because it's just laden with lessons on leadership. Probably none more important than this one right here. This idea that attitude reflects leadership. That your organization, your office, your squadron, your brigade, your battalion, your company will go 
as you go. That you're responsible for setting the tone, for setting the pace, for setting the culture, for setting the environment within your organization. I get to experience this live. I travel about 300, and 300 days a year. Anywhere we remotely might have airmen, I try to get out and see them. So I get to go to a lot of organizations. And normally when I enter into an organization, the first touch point is with the commander, the first sergeant, the chief, the, the organization's leadership. And it goes one of two ways. Chief, let me tell you how bad it is here. Let me tell you how hard it is. Let me tell you how challenging things are. Let me tell you how much it sucks. Let me tell you how bad we have it. What I know in my mind, what I hear is, yeah, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and typically, when I go out and see the airmen from that organization, what do you think they say? Wah, 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 chief, let me tell you how. The second way that it goes is something like this. You know, chief, it's tough out here. We're at a GSU, we're isolated, but let me tell you about some of the things that we're doing to make life better for all of our airmen. Let me tell you how we're working with our partners to get around some of these challenges or so on and so forth. And let me tell you about the great airmen that we have in this organization. Ah. And what do you think happens when I go out on the base and visit those airmen? Yeah, same thing. Chief, it's tough out here but let me tell you about some of the wonderful things that, that we're doing. So I'm telling you, this is a, an extremely important concept that I think we all should take heed to, that your attitude is a reflection. Your, the people's and your organization's attitude is a re direct reflection of your leadership. I'd, I'd like to take just a minute to tell you about me. And I typically don't like talking about myself during these types of presentations. But the reason that I want to talk about my journey is because many times we see chiefs, chief master sergeants of the Air Force, generals, senior leaders from whatever capacity, and we think, wow, this guy or girl must have been really smart. They must have had a great career. Uh, I'll never be able to be in their shoes or do what, what they did because of whatever the circumstances. Well, I like to tell you how I got from this picture on the left to the picture on the right. I, th I thought it was interesting in the picture on the left, uh, on, on my left, you're this one in the blues. <laughs> There's a first sergeant in the background. You can kind of barely see him, but he has a look on his face like, yeah, I don't think this guy's going to amount to much. <laughs> and he had good reason to believe that at the time, because when I was a young airman, I tell you, I was a menace to society. I like to drink, I like to fight, I like to show up to work late, and I don't mean a few minutes late, I mean a couple of hours late. I like to whine, I like to complain, I like to do all the things except what I was supposed to be doing as a young airman. But I had a great mentor whose attitude and whose example helped me get to where I am today. And so I can't speak enough about the importance of great leaders with great attitudes and the importance that they can have on changing your career around. Now, I think it's also important because, again, even after I got to a point where I said, okay, let me, let me do a 180 and get my life together, uh, I, stopped getting, I stopped receiving letters of reprimand, letters of admonishment, letters of counseling, and all the other forms of paperwork that uh, I, I typically got. I started coming to work on time and, and doing some of the other things, even after that. I didn't have a, a stellar career. I still have some bumps in the road. So don't, don't ever think that you can't reach and become the leader that you aspire to be just because you've had a few bumps in the road. It happens to most of us. I saw a lot of chiefs on my way uh, into the, the auditorium this morning. And one thing I can tell you about most of the chiefs in our Air Force, because I get an opportunity to evaluate many of them and their records, is many of them have Article 15s and many of them have the same uh, stack of paperwork that I got and they still made it to where they are today. So don't ever think that you can't be a great leader in our Air Force because you make just a, a, a few mistakes. I'd also like to share really quickly uh, my leadership philosophy. So it took me a while, so many, many years from the time that I was a young staff sergeant in the early 1990s until today, I'm always refining how I approach leadership, 
how I go about leading others. Very simple philosophy for, for me. First and foremost, man, I set high standards. If you don't work for, for me, you want to be around me, you have to excel. The way you look, the way you dress, the way you speak, the way we deal with customers, the way we deal with our joint partners and what have you, I always make the standards up here, very high. You don't get a free pass. And then I worked really hard in all of these leadership courses and all of this experience and all of the things that I've learned over the years to motivate, to encourage, to inspire. Uh, sometimes I have to kick and fight and punch and choke to get people to rise up to these standards because not everybody wants to. Not everybody wants to be great every single day. But I think I owe it to them as a leader to get them moving in that right direction. That's the most difficult and most challenging part because it doesn't happen overnight. But the most important component of my leadership philosophy is, man, I have to lead by example. And I heard General Wilson mention that this morning. I don't get to say, hey, uh, standards are high. I need you guys to be here at work at 7 o'clock. But I have a lot of meetings and have to drink a lot of coffee, and you guys don't understand what it means to be the chief master sergeant in the Air Force. So I'll be here around 10. <laughs> no. I want you to excel in fitness and all these other things, but, hey, you don't understand. I'm so busy. I travel a lot, so I'm just going to do just enough to get by. Absolutely not. So whatever your leadership philosophy is, I want you to think about it and continue to refine it. I'm continuing to refine mine. I'm, I'm an avid reader uh, of leadership and podcasts and all those things. So I'm always trying to be the best leader uh, that I can be and display that attitude so that the people around me uh, can be inspired. Now, when it comes to leadership, most of us, we focus on all the people around us, the bad boss that we have, the bad people that work for us, the environment and the situation and all these other things. We focus on everything except what? Ourselves. In your quest to become a great leader, you're your greatest competition. If you're good enough, You'll change the environment. You'll change the culture. You'll make a difference in the situation. You'll even, to some extent, change the people around them. You might motivate, encourage, and inspire them, and, and what have you. But there's no better place to start being a great leader than, than right here. This is about you. And I don't mean in a, in a selfish way. But what you, what you really should be thinking about in this leadership quest, this leadership journey, how can I become a better version of me? So let's talk about some keys to success on your leadership journey. First one, no secret, this is the National Character and Leadership Symposium. Why don't we start with character? This has to be the foundation of being great leaders. And let's not confuse character with personality. Personality is what's on the outside, what everybody sees. Oh, man, look at Chief Wright. He's always smiling. He loves, I mean, he's, oh, he loves his airmen, and he loves being in front of crowds and delivering these speeches. And deep down, I might be saying, man, this sucks. I'm so tired of giving these speeches. <laughs> Character is what's on the inside. Who are you? What do you stand for? What's your personal ethos? What values do you display? Where do you stand? Integrity service, excellence, honesty, trustworthiness. I tell you, if you want to be a successful leader, it has to begin there. We lose a lot of leaders. We just lost one yesterday. Colonels, chiefs, general officers, airmen, and everything in between. But I want to focus on our senior leaders. And you know how many of them we lose because of incompetence? because they don't know enough, because they're not trained well enough. Zero, zilch, none. You know how many we lose because of character flaws and character issues? Almost all of them. So I can't overemphasize the importance of, if you want to be a leader, if you want to lead by example, character has to be the foundation. you got to have a great attitude. Who wants to follow somebody with a bad attitude? 
Yeah, life sucks. And sometimes being in leadership position, it sucks. But your job is to make sure that you can keep the people that work for you and around you focused. And one way to do that is to maintain a positive attitude, a positive outlook on life. This will take you a long way. I haven't always, I was telling the cadets last night, I, don't, I haven't always had the opportunity to hire my own staff, uh, but I do now. So I have a staff of about seven, sometimes eight people that work in our, our front office. We, I have a few of them that's here with me today. And when you get to, to, to this level of leadership, everybody's talented. What I'm looking for, attitude. Who has the positive attitude? Who can deal with the challenges of being in the senior level positions? So again, never underestimate the importance of having a positive attitude as a leader. Think for a minute. Anybody you know in this world, whether you know them personally, and, and I don't know any of them personally, obviously, except the chief of staff, my boss. Someone you know personally, someone that's famous, someone that you admire. I want you to ask yourself, do you think they became great leaders? Do you think they became successful by being undisciplined? You think people have to wake them up first thing in the morning? You think people have to tell them to work out, to eat right, to be on time? No, I don't think so. So if you want to be a great leader, you have to be disciplined. And for those of you, I know we have some cadets here, and I know we have some folks that are in, in other uh, schools and, and whatnot. Sometimes when you're in an organization like this, USAFA or whatever uh, school that you may be attending and for our enlisted airmen, you know, when you're in BMT and tech training, the discipline is built in. Somebody tells you where to go, when to do it, when to study, when to wake up, you know, when to shave, when to eat, when not to eat, when to go to bed, all that good stuff. But as you approach your leadership journey, nobody, nobody's going to tell you that. It's really up to you. And so you have to be disciplined in your every, and it starts with every single day. What time do you wake up? What routines do you have first thing in the morning? How do you organize your day? So discipline is, is key. I'd like you to do something for me. I'd like you to eliminate this phrase from your, first I want you to eliminate it from your mind, then I want you to eliminate it from your vocabulary, and then I think you'll be successful in eliminating it from your day-to-day -day actions. That's good enough. Ask yourself how often, either consciously or subconsciously, do you think when you are given a task, when you're supposed to accomplish something, when your wife or your husband asks you to wash the dishes or what have you, do you say to yourself, you know, you kind of halfway do it and then you think, you know what, uh, I got to watch the game. That's good enough. What I want you to replace it with is, hey, how about wake up every day and think, think to yourself, how can I be great today? How can I become the best version of me? Aristotle said, excellence is not a singular act, but it is a habit. We are what we do repeatedly. Now, a famous admiral at a famous service academy that happens to be in, Anna in Annapolis, you know, he, he told a story, a very famous story, and, and then he wrote a book about this idea of making your bed. You familiar? You wake up every day, you make your bed, and you start off right there with a victory. Well, I happen to wake up at 5 o'clock. My wife wakes up a little bit later than me, so I don't get to make my bed and have that victory. I, I've tried. I tried to make it up with her in it, and it just didn't, didn't work out. <laughs> but I really liked his philosophy so much, I said, okay, how, how, what, what else can I do to symbolize starting my day off with a bit of excellence? So every single day, every single day without fail, to include Saturday and Sunday when I'm not working, I wake up and I shave my face with a straight razor, and then I shave my head with a different 
kind of razor every day. Now, for those of you, and I see a lot of bald head guys in here, for those of you who shave, whether it's your face or your head, you kind of understand that once you finish, especially, you know, when I shave my face, I, I have to mix up and with the little brush and stuff. So there's shaving cream and toothpaste and crap all everywhere, over the mirror, all over the sink, and so on and so forth. And what I used to do is tell myself, if I don't clean this sink off, my wife is going to kill me. So I would wipe it off a little bit, and this is and that. There'd still be a little bit of dots on the mirror, shaving cream here and there. And then I say, but I got to get to work because I got to be the right example, and I got to be on time, and so on and so forth. So those five little dots or those three little hairs, that's good enough. No, it's not. Today, without fail, I will not leave my house, I will not leave this lodging room that I'm staying in without the sink being spick and span. It is my way of starting every single day saying to myself, Khalif, you'll be great today. There is no good enough. So think about how you can practice excellence as part of who you are every single day as a leader because that's what your airmen, that's what your employees expect of you. Man, none of us can go it alone. If you want to be a great leader, you got to be a part of something bigger than yourself. One of my favorite African proverbs, you want to go fast, go alone, you want to go far, go together. This is a picture of myself and all of our MAGCOM command chiefs, my peers. And it's just an indication of how tight we are, how much fun we have. We were at my house for a 12 Outstanding Airmen of the Year celebration. And I know we have some of our 12 Outstanding Airmen uh, here with us today, and we'll get a chance to speak with them tomorrow. And I really do lean and depend on them to help me manage all of the enlisted programs in our United States Air Force. I receive much of the credit as being the face of the enlisted force, the enlisted Jesus memes and all that other stuff. <laughs> and I appreciate it, I do. I'm very thankful for the, for the support. But I could not do what I do without the folks in my office, the ones that I pointed out earlier that are here, and without my teammates, the fellow senior chief master sergeants in our United States Air Force. Who are your wingmen? Who are your teammates? Who helps you get it done? Just a few other thoughts. Man, as a leader, you, you're responsible for speaking truth to power. Things won't, you won't always agree with your boss. You won't always agree with the direction. You won't always agree with the direction that your organization might be going. And there are times when you have a responsibility as a leader to speak up. But I want you to take this responsibility very seriously and be very careful with how you do this. This is not a free ticket to say whatever you want whenever you want. This is not a ticket to every time you disagree to say, well, wait a minute, boss, I don't think we need to do this. In this life, we all get two butts. And I learned this from a great leader who was a mentor and supervisor of mine, uh, Alex Perry. You get two butts. Well, hey, chief, you know, I, I think we need to roll out and, and, and do this. But sir, I think if we do that, uh, the airmen are not going to be happy, and it's going to have an adverse impact on morale. Now, I have one more but, sir, before I have to salute smartly and move out. And so I need to make sure that before I continue to push back, I really understand, hey, what are the consequences? What am I fighting for? Is this worth falling on the sword for? And it very well may be. But you quickly start to lose credibility when you fall on the sword for every single thing. So be careful how you approach this speaking truth to power. Man, pride.
probably one of the more important aspects of leadership. Most successful people, most great leaders have a very high level of emotional intelligence. And it's really, really, and I don't know how much you've studied it, but I would encourage you to, to study emotional intelligence. It's really kind of broken into two components, a personal component, your ability to recognize your own emotions, you know, how upset you get or what the emotions that, that happen uh, when you encounter certain things or when you talk to certain people, and then your ability to control your emotions. And then a social component, your ability to recognize when you get on other people's nerves, basically and then manage those relationships accordingly. How many of you yourselves, or how many of you have worked for leaders who fly off the handle at everything, who get gravely upset about everything? There's a time to show some emotion. There's a time to show some passion. There's a time to let people know, hey, I'm serious about this. There's also a time to show how excited you are about someone's success or what have you. But by and large, if you want to be respected, if you want to be a great leader, you have to make sure you understand and practice good emotional intelligence. Man, I... You know, as, as a leader, you know, right now, physically, yes, I'm, I'm on stage. But when, when you're a leader, you're always on stage. People are always watching. And now with the advent of technology and social media. And so particularly at the opportunities when you have to, whether it's on a stage like this in front of, you know, a thousand people or when you stand up in your office in front of seven people, the one thing you have to have is you have to be credible. People have to trust you. They have to believe in you. And if you want to be credible, man, you got to deliver. You have to be transparent. When you have a credibility gap, it'll show. And your ability to motivate, encourage, and inspire airmen, it will continue to be diminished. Some people believe that once you lose your credibility, you can't get it back. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I, I think that it, there are times when you lose your credibility for whatever reason. I think if you continue to do these things, make the tough calls, be consistent, lead by example, be transparent, you can reestablish your credibility as a leader. Kind of glad my wife Tanya is not here. Because she always gets on me when I talk about this. I used to call it work-life balance like everybody else in the world, right? It's not like I made it up. Um, now I refer to it more as harmony. This is a tough thing. This is a tough thing, and I, and I know we have a lot of uh, general officers and retired general officers and senior leaders uh, in, the, in the room today that most of us struggle with this. How to maintain that work-life harmony. I've tried and talked about the 210, 5, 7, two hours for yourself in the morning, 10 hours of work, five hours unplugged, seven hours of sleep. I can get the two and the 10 right. The rest of it is out the window for me. I don't think I can ever, and I don't think most leaders, most leaders would agree that when you talk about work-life balance, you know, you kind of have this picture of the scales that, hey, I'll, I'll get as much time at home with my family as I will uh, at work. And typically, it doesn't work that way. What I try to do now to maintain harmony uh, with me and my wife is, you know, I really try to plan out and look at the calendar. This week, um, going for three or four days, I'll land on Friday, and then I'll be back out I think I testified next week, and then I'll be back on the road next Tuesday or Wednesday. So guess what you think I'll be doing this weekend? I'll be cleaning the house. I'll be washing the dishes. I'll be doing all the things my wife wants me to do, and then I'm going to take her out on a nice date. And then I'll be on the road for a couple of weeks. But, and when we do have the time together, I try to take advantage of it. 
You have to figure out what works best for you. But this is something that's extremely important. In order for you to become the best version of yourself, to become the best leader that you can, you need some, some work-life harmony. And there, there's a couple of tips. <clears throat> what about this whole social media thing as a leader? Should you, should you not? Should you use social media? Um, I, I decided to use social media as a means of communicating with all of the airmen across the Air Force. And we've had, I would say, some pretty good success. Getting the word out for various changes. Uh, when we had the, not the first government shutdown, but the, the government shutdown, I think it was around last August or so, uh, my team and I were full up on social media trying to answer as many questions as we can. This is a place where I get to highlight uh, many of our errand and the things that we're doing and just an overall way of communicating. The only advice that I will give to you as a leader when it comes to social media is you got to be in or out, right? So this is not like, so I have a, a, a professional Facebook page and an and Instagram and then I have a personal uh, Facebook page. On my personal Facebook page, I can post whenever I feel like it. So sometimes I might post something today. It might, I might go three or four weeks before you see another cigar or glass of scotch or whatever I might be uh, doing round of golf. But on your, if you're going to use this as a means at, to communicate with your team, you got to be in and you got to have relevant content. And frankly, uh, unless you're a public affairs professional or someone that's really good with this, you got to have somebody on your team that can do this and help you, um, that can do this for you or help you with, with this type of stuff. But I tell you, it is an incredible way to communicate with um, the folks that you serve. And it, again, it's worked well for me. I tell you what, if you don't remember anything we talk about today, I want you to remember this. Being a leader is hard, it's demanding, it's time consuming. Most of you spend your entire adult lives taking care of your airmen, your soldiers, your sailors, your Marines, your employees, your teammates, your bosses. All of your efforts and all of your focus is on other people because that's what is demanding, demanded of us as leaders. And we spend very little time taking care of us because we think it's selfish. I never paid attention to, and, and, and please don't be offended if you're here and you're a flight attendant, but I never paid attention to flight attendants as much as I've been on airplanes in my entire life. When I sit down on an airplane, I put my headphones on or I pretend like I'm getting ready to read a book or whatever it is I'm going to do before I fall asleep, you know, normally before we take off. <laughs> but recently, I started paying attention. And after the flight attendant shows me how to put my seatbelt on and actually how to take it off, very good information, <laughs> he or she says, hey, if this cabin loses pressure, a mask will drop down and you must do what? Put your mask on first. Why does she say that? He or she says that because exactly right. If you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband, your neighbor, or whoever that's sitting next to you. And I would say the same thing for all of you as leaders. If you don't take care of you, how are you going to take care of them? If you don't make sure that you're physically, mentally, spiritually fit, that you have a strong social circle, how are you going to take care of everybody else? I spent the first year uh, in this job traveling around the United States Air Force. General Wilson and I did a, man, a huge trip to um, the AOR and visited our, our folks. I think I, I did about 285 days. And the whole time I was saying to myself, I was making these excuses. Well, I'm kind of busy. I'm traveling a lot. You know, I, I don't really have time to go to the gym. Uh, I would eat right, but all we got here is these donuts and all this other stuff. So I'll just eat that. No, no problem. Now, I haven't been sick. 
I'm a G. I don't get sick. I haven't been sick <laughs> since like 1971. I was born in 1970. I don't get sick <laughs> until last year. Man, I just hit a wall because I wasn't putting my mask on first. I wasn't taking care of me. Had to take two days off of work, laid up. And it was at that point that I decided, you know, I'm going to make time to go to the gym every day. My wife and I, we, went, we swung the pendulum all the way. And we went and we became vegans for two weeks. <laughs> man, that's, that's hard, man. And then we became vegetarians for two months. <laughs> and then we became pescatarians. And that lasted. So we, we still eat fish. But I mean, I, I really realized that, man, in order for me to take care of the almost 500,000 enlisted airmen, total force airmen that we have in the Air Force, I got to be in shape. I got to have energy at the right time. I gotta have my stuff together spiritually, mentally. I have to put my mask on first and I have to take care of me. So if you don't remember anything from today's conversation, put your mask on first. What questions do you have for me? So she asked, what, what inspired me to change from the young airman who was screwing up? This is exactly what she said. Uh, <laughs> when I was uh, a senior airman, so I had a little bit more than three years in the United States Air Force, my uh, mentor, Joe Wimbush, he gave me a piece of paper and he said, hey, uh, I need you to go over and join the base honor guard. I gave him the paper back and said, not my style, not into the military like that, I'll pass. He gave it back to me along with some choice words that I dare not use here at USAFA. And uh, so anyway, I joined the base honor guard and I thought to myself, man, this is pretty nice. So I'm doing all these ceremonies um, and more importantly, uh, I'm doing a lot of funerals. I was stationed at Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina. And so we had an area of North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, we were responsible for uh, doing these funerals. So I finally got to work my way up to be uh, the person who presented the flag to the next of kin. And I was presenting a flag to this lady, didn't know her from Adam. I, I was just there to make sure that, you know, the shots went off at, at the, the, seven, the 21 gun salute and the flag was folded, no red showing, all that good stuff. Um, well, I, I, I knelt down, I made this statement on behalf of the President of the United States, this grateful nation, we present you this flag on behalf of your spouse's honorable service, so on and so forth. And uh, she had tears in her eyes. And I could see how much she appreciated, you know, what we were doing. It was, um, it was a spring in North Carolina. There was pollen, and my eyes started watering. And, uh, <laughs> and I said to myself, at that very moment, Khalif, you have to get your act together. You have to take your career more serious. And that started the, the 180. I had a lot more bumps along the way, but that was the moment I decided, you know what, I'm going to be somebody. I, I didn't think it would be this, but uh, that, was, that was the beginning of my turnaround. If you had one key to staying dedicated, what would it be? One key to staying dedicated is, man, find your purpose. Figure out why you wake up every day. Figure out, you know, why you're on this earth. My favorite book is The Alchemist by author uh, Paolo Coelho. And he says that once you discover, it, he, he refers to it as personal legend, loosely means your purpose in life the entire universe conspires to help you achieve it. And so what keeps me committed and dedicated is I understand my purpose, that I'm here to help others, to inspire others, to help others discover their purpose and help put them on a path to be successful. So uh, if you can figure out why you're here, you can stay committed to it. Thank you. So Chief Wright, Cadet Martis, 159th Cadet Wayne, University of Central Florida. You said, uh, when we make these changes, uh, 
How do we continue to evaluate ourselves and our team, and how do we know that these are the right changes that we've made uh, to benefit ourselves in the long run? Yeah, so you talk about when you make changes in yourself and your leadership style and your personality and whatnot? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Ask for feedback. Real, real simple. Ask for feedback and keep your mouth closed when you're receiving it. Because <laughs> most time, you know, we as leaders, we say, hey, give me some feedback. How am I doing? Well, you know, you always cut me off. Well, that's because, you know, we don't have it. <laughs> right? And then we start making up every excuse for why we da da da. I think you should just say, hey, I'm on a quest to become a better leader. And I'm, so I'm trying, I heard these things that Chief Wright and all these other great speakers talked about at this conference that I went to, and I'm trying to be better. And uh, so over the next couple of weeks, if you don't mind, if you could take some notes and give me some feedback on how well I'm doing. And when they give you feedback, good, bad, indifferent, just say this, thank you. Work on the things that you agree with, that you think you need to work on and continue to get better at. The ones you don't agree with, no, no harm, no foul, let it. Uh, wash off your back, but I would just ask for feedback and that and that your your folks will let you know whether you're doing good or not. Thank you, Chief. Morning, sir. C1C Monica Mama, Squadron 27. Thank you for coming and uh, sharing everything with us today. Um, I truly believe that when it comes to discipline as a fighter and former boxer here at the Air Force Academy, <laughs> That, that truly when you do step in the ring, there's no such thing as good enough unless you want to get knocked out. And I really think that that pertains to taking care of our airmen, like you've mentioned, and, and staying disciplined. And so my question for you is very simple, and it pertains to this brown book here. And I was just wondering if you could sign it for me. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Cadet Kim from Detachment 60. Uh, my question is, could you give us an example of a hard decision you had to make as a leader? Hmm. Of the many hard decisions, let me see, what's a, what's a good one? My very first airman that I supervised, I was a, a young staff sergeant and he had had some normal, much like the problems that, that I had, um, nothing really too bad. Uh, and then he made a really big mistake. Uh, he, got a, he got a DUI. Now, deep down, I knew he was a great airman. And, and oh, by the way, he, he had my last name, too, right? Very first airman right off the bat with my, my last name, everybody associated with me. And uh, I knew he was, a, I knew he was a, a great airman deep down inside. Um, but he made this, what, what I would consider a, a pretty huge mistake. He was, he was really, really drunk and, and really could have uh, killed, killed someone. And <clears throat> my, as me, my first sergeant and the commander, we sat down to try to determine, uh, hey, what, what should we do with this guy? Should we let him stay in the Air Force? Uh, should we separate him? You know, how, how should this work? And um, it was a really tough decision for me because I felt like with a little more time, I could work on him, I can get him to where he needed to be. Um, but deep down, I thought, you know, I don't think he's, he, he's going to change. And so I made the decision um, along with the first sergeant and commander because they depended on me to help them make this decision uh, to separate him from, from the Air Force. So kind of right off the bat, I started off uh, as a failure in my, in my mind uh, as a leader, but that was a tough, a really tough decision uh, that, I, that I had to help my commander make. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm listening. Good morning, Chief. Airman First Class Wenzel. Um, my question is, how did you find the motivation to consistent be resilient even through all the hardships that you faced? Yeah. Um, some of it was because like I mentioned earlier, I decided when I was a senior airman I was gonna be someone, so I always had a goal. I decided when I was a senior airman that I was gonna be a chief, so I always had a goal. So whenever I, I met some type of barrier, whenever I did something stupid, uh, which, which I did quite often, uh, you know, I would fall down and then I would say to myself, but man, you gotta get to, remember you said you were gonna be a chief, so you gotta get back up. But I tell you what was probably most impactful, what really helped me out the most was I, mean, I had great people around me. I had great wingmen, I had great teammates, I had a great mentor 
uh, who told me the truth, who told me about myself. I'll give you a good example. Um, Ma'am, can I pick this up? Can you pick this up after we finish? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, when I was a senior master sergeant, <clears throat> I, I worked for this, this chief, and um, I didn't like her. And so I cursed her out, right? So I was a senior master sergeant. She was chief master sergeant. She was trying to give me some advice and guidance and mentorship and all that type of stuff. And uh, I, well, it wasn't polite, but... But I basically said to her, you know what, I reject this counseling. Don't want it, don't need it, and get the blah, 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 blah. And so I got a bad EPR and, and all this other stuff, got in some trouble. And <clears throat> so I was kind of down in the dumps because at, at, at this point I thought my career was over. But a senior airman, his name is Damon Stokes, walked into my office and he said, hey, Sarge, can I tell you something? I think you're a hypocrite. You're always talking to us about see it through, be strong, you know, um, work through your problems, keep fighting. Now you're going through something and you're quitting on us. <laughs> so I said, hey man, get the hell out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went home that night and I said, man, this guy's right, right? And had it not been for him, I think I would have just quit. I mean, so that was a pretty defining moment. So, so help resilience for me uh, earlier in my career was really having great people around me to help me work through the tough times and uh, now uh, making sure that I stay physically mentally uh, fit is really helpful I do a lot of meditating uh, and things of that nature yes sir hi chief uh, Mike Tillman uh, class of 73 let's hear it guys <laughs> hey I really appreciate your comments about the, it's good advice the two butts right not, not where I thought you were going but anyway um, you're in a position now where you probably get some of the, hey, chief, that's a great idea, but probably from those guys that were lying on your couch mm -hmm. and other people. Can you give uh, maybe some ideas of how you handle that when that comes to you? And is there maybe an example of a time that actually changed your mind and you thought you had a great idea and it turned out to not be so great? Yes, sir. Um, so with, with them, one, I, you know, I really see us as a team and of all of the changes and all of the things that, that we try to do, I, I try not to be emotionally tied to any of them. Uh, we just recently changed how we promote our senior non-commissioned officers. So for, since 1972, uh, senior non-commissioned officers have been taking uh, what we call a WAPS test, weighted airman promotion system, and uh, I felt like it was time to change. Many of those guys on the couch and the, and the guys and girls on the couch, they didn't think it was the, the best idea. And so, uh, you know, they use their two butts and four or five and six and seven more. I mean, we were just wearing each other down trying to get to the, to the right thing. And the entire time, I tried to stay, keep all up, keep the emotion out of it and say, hey, what's best for our senior non-commissioned officers in the United States Air Force? And then we ultimately finally got to uh, the, the right decision, something I actually learned from Jeff Bezos when he came to speak to us. Hey, let's just disagree and commit. So we still have varying uh, thoughts about whether it's the right, the right decision or not. Uh, when I was a wing command chief, uh, I thought it was going to be a great idea. Hey, I think we should do in-person boards for our below the zone uh, senior and below the zone program. And I, I mean, I was sold on it. I had seen it before. I came from Kadena. I know it works. And uh, the maintenance chief kind of convinced me that, uh, yeah, it might have worked there, but it won't work here because, you know, our folks are always TDY. They won't have a fair chance and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so he, he, he changed my mind. And uh, so I'm, I'm pretty flexible and pretty, pretty open. Uh, there are some things I'm passionate about that I'll, I'll kind of stick to, but, but most things, if you give me the data, I'm very objective, and uh, I'll, allow, I'll allow the data and what's best for our service to prevail. We have time for one more question. We'll make it two. <laughs> we'll make it two. I know you've been standing there. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for coming out today. Um, my question to you is, as a leader, you are in charge of the well-being of your team, those subordinate to you and those that you consider your peers. What do you recommend to remedy internal conflicts between team members? Yeah, so I think uh, most of the time when you have internal conflict, it's really based on a lack of understanding. Sometimes it might be a lack of understanding of uh, what our purpose is, what our role 
roles are individually or as an organization. And so uh, the easiest way to improve that is you have to be able to improve the ability of you and your teammates to communicate. So this is not something that's foreign to me or my team that I have now, uh, the, the, the larger team of, of chiefs that I work with. Uh, lots of confusion sometimes. Sometimes we get uh, off kilter in terms of, hey, what are we really trying to get after? And so uh, we've done, in my office, uh, we've done off-sites. We have an off-site coming up to try to improve our ability to communicate with each other, to understand each other, and make sure that we're all kind of singing the same song, marching to the same uh, beat, but. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Last question. Good morning, Chief. Uh, Cadet Second Class Monty Lyons, Cadet Squadron 37. So my question is actually going to piggyback off that. Um, oftentimes here at the Academy and then as well as in the Air Force, we're racked and stacked against each other, like we're pitted against each other for promotions or for AFSCs. So my question is regarding like how do you build that team and how did you get like your team to be so cohesive? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think healthy competition, right? And if you watch the movie uh, play out, Remember the Titans, uh, you'll kind of see how healthy competition actually drives the performance of the entire organization up. And that's what we attempt to do in our United States Air Force. Uh, may not always be successful. I, I mean, I've heard people talk about, hey, being in the Air Force sometimes is like the Hunger Games where, you know, everybody's trying to fight for their own survival and, and you know, and I, I don't disagree and, 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 and whatnot. Uh, but I think if you can help people understand, hey, this is why we're here, this is what we're trying to do, you, you add in the healthy competition so that we all grow, um, th there's room for all of us to be successful. There, I, and I'm not saying that everybody can be a colonel or a general or a chief or what have you. Obviously, there's limitations to that. But that doesn't necessarily define success either. And so I think if we all understand, not every officer in the Air Force wants to be a general. Not every airman, not every enlisted airman wants to be a chief. So if we can collectively define, hey, what does success mean for our organization and balance that against, hey, what does success mean for me as an individual? then the healthy competition can really be good at in helping assist in the entire organization um, reach whatever goals that we have set for ourselves. Thank you, Chief. All right, so remember, attitude reflects leadership. If you hadn't had an opportunity to check out Remember the Titans, please do. Thank you so much for inviting me and my team here. I'm looking forward to the rest of uh, the symposium. And if you have any additional questions, I'll be around uh, for the next couple of days. So thank you.